of the program. And now let me introduce our panelists this evening. Um, R.C. Barnes is a former film and television executive. She is the author of the Tattoo Teller, Tattoo Teller Young Adult Series. Her novel, Ink for the Beloved, part of the Tattoo Teller series, is, is a love letter to her adolescent years in the East Bay. The second book in the series, Ink for the Damned, releases, uh, will be released this year? Next month. Next month. Along with the launch of a spin-off series, Echo. Um, Robin has published many short stories, dystopian anthologies, and has three short reads introducing the Ta Tattoo Teller series, Pretty Little Gun, The Girl Who Spoke With Spirits, and River Dogs. Welcome, Robin. Our next panelist is Kevin Eastman. She, he, he is a native of Oakland and Kevin is a skilled speaker and business management consultant. He retired from active duty in the US Air Force with over 20 years of service with stints as a military training instructor and over a decade as a recruiter at the high school, college, and postgraduate levels. Kevin became a published author in 2018 with his nonfiction book, Don't Gamble on Life Improvement, Until You Shift the Odds. Welcome, Kevin Eastman. Thank you for having me, I appreciate it. Our next panelist is Jerry Forte. And um, having some uh, uh, video issues, so, uh, can you hear us, Jerry? Yes, I can. All right, but we we have audio. It's good. And Jerry is a resident of San Jose, and uh, she serves as the managing editor of Writer's Talk, the monthly newsletter of the South Bay chapter of the California Writers Club. Her first published book is titled Appropriating Old Cultures in New Futures from the Kingdom of Tonga to California. Forte's other writings include the novels of Prayers and Beatings, The Sinceria, Pound Cake Extraordinaire, A Recipe for Life, and her latest book, A Brand New Song to Sing. Welcome, Jerry. Thank you. And our next panelist is Dira Williams. Well, Dira is an Oakland author of fiction, nonfiction, and memoirs. She has contributed to over two dozen anthologies and journals, and her most current contribution is a magic realism story, an excerpt in the forthcoming anthology, New Transmissions from the Dark Fantastic Continuum. She has compiled a collection of childhood memories uh, in her book, In My Backyard, Stories of Growing Up in Oakland. Her great migration novel, Serving Tea at Miss Bell's, at Miss Bell's, and a novella against all, titled Against All Odds, are near completion. She has been a member and co-director of the Afro Surreal Writers Workshop in Oakland for five years. Welcome, Dira. Thank you. Nice to have you. And last but certainly not least, I would like to introduce the moderator of tonight's panel conversation, whose efforts made this program tonight possible. I'm talking about award-winning author Tina Jones Williams. Tina. A Livermore resident is the author of nine books that pay homage to the rich traditions in the African American community. She is a proud and active member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated and a contributor to the Berkeley Historical Society and the South Berkeley Legacy Project. In addition, 
Tina is a member of the National League of American Pen Women and a literacy and career coach. Her latest book titled, It Happened on Our Watch, was published in September of last year and is available to request from the Livermore Public Library. Welcome, Tina, and welcome to our panelists. Thank you, Paul, for those wonderful um, introductions. We appreciate them. We also appreciate you giving us the opportunity to be part of this program and for giving voice to so many different and diverse stories. I'd like to also thank the Livermore Library for hosting us and for providing such a rich uh, Black history program um, this month. So feel free to go and check out the website to see what else they are, have on offer. Tonight really is um, Paul's brainchild. He came to me with the idea of having a panel discussion this year to honor uh, Black History Month. And it was my pleasure and really my honor to be able to invite all of these authors to join us tonight. Um, a little bit of housekeeping. If you see me looking down, it's because I have my notes here and I don't want to forget anything. And also um, a little bit about the process. Each author, including myself, is going to have an opportunity to answer um, two questions, the same two, and then one that is um, directed specifically at them and their writing. And then we'll have an opportunity to read a very short piece of our selection um, from one of our books. So that's kind of how it will go. When Paul suggested that we have this conversation tonight, he also, we had a talk about what we would call it and what we would pursue. And we decided on the power of storytelling. So what I do did is what I always do. I Googled it up, Googled it. And storytelling, they say, is the vivid description of ideas, beliefs, personal experiences and life lessons shared through stories or narratives. And that's exactly what we've done, I believe, with our books and with our personal appearances as well. So with that, I'd like to get started. And I think that I will put Kevin on the spot first. Um, and I'd like to ask you a question, Kevin. Why do you write? Well, for me, it's it, the obvious answer is is because it's something that I enjoy doing, but more so um, to to get information out there. You know, one of the things that I, that I I learned as it as in the Air Force is information knowledge is gained by information being passed. So you never know where you're going to get your information that gets you to the next point that you need. Uh, you talk to everybody, you know, anybody and everybody that you can, and and that's kind of why I write. I try to write to get things out and you never know who you're going to inspire so that's where that's kind of where my inspiration for my writing comes from so would it be putting you on the spot to ask you to read a little bit from your book of right now right now <laughs> Right now, okay, I can do that right now. I actually have a, a, a passage that I'm going to read really quickly. Um, it's from chapter four of my book. My book is titled, uh, as Paul said earlier, Don't Gamble on Life Improvement Until You Shift the Odds, which is a complete metaphor for uh, don't try to make changes in your life until you change your mindset. So the passage I'm going to read is actually from chapter four of my book called, uh, um, the, the, the title is uh, A Fear of Winning, which is a metaphor as well. But what I, I put on there, I'm going to put, I'm going to read down. So I'm going to look down so that, that uh, everybody knows and I'm, I'm looking down, I'm reading, I'm not uh, ignoring anybody. But I, the, what the, uh, the context is, uh, the fear of winning is how people, um, they are so afraid of success that they kind of uh, intentionally or unintentionally uh, engage in self-sabotage, so to speak. So what I'm, I'm gonna start with uh, this, everybody has a desire to win. Not everyone is prepared to win. 
It isn't always easy to spot the light at the end of the tunnel, but it is there. Success is yours for the taking, but it's not going to be handed to you. It takes an amount, enormous amount of courage to change the course of your life in order to, to obtain success, but it can be done. You must be willing to go over, under, around, or even through any obstacle that happens to be blocking your path to it. Think about this. Everything you want to achieve in life is located just on the other side of fear, pride, and self-doubt. The things you need are the motivation, the methods, and the tools to get you over there. So I, I use that. It, it, it kind of put what I what I do in my in my writing is I try to get uh, people to I try to get have a high degree of realism in my writing kind of put the person so that they can put themselves in the story and that way it has a bigger impact and that's why i write the way that i write so let me ask you this give us a little bit of context in terms of obviously you didn't just one day sit down and start writing <laughs> what was what was the catalyst what made you decide that at that point in time you were going to write that book Oh, it's interesting because my book actually didn't start out as a book. It started out as a series of, of personal essays that I was using as self-reflection because life was not going the way that I wanted it to go. And I had to figure out why it was not going the way I wanted it to go. So, so I started writing and writing more and more. And then I started thinking, uh-oh, I'm not the only one that can benefit from what I'm learning. So let me go ahead and publish this. And that's where the book came from. Okay. Well, thank you for that. So I'd like to now move to Robin. And Robin, I'd like to ask you, why do you write? Um, I write, well, I think actually because it's more of like what I write. Um, I write books that I could not find on the shelves when I was a young girl. Um, I am an avid, I'm a voracious reader. I read everything, even romance and uh, you, know, you name it, Western, uh, sci-fi, fantasy, I read it. Um, and when I was younger, I was, I loved adventure stories. I love fantasies. Um, I love stories about people who rode dragons, but I didn't see any stories where there was a black girl on a dragon and that bothered me. Um, and then later on, I started to notice that any stories that featured a black girl, well, the story was about her being black. It was, and a lot of times they were historical. They dealt with some trauma really on a certain level, either through the, the girl or the family or the boy. It was just, there was always trauma. It was always about bad things happening and how they persevered. I think those stories are important. So I'm not saying that they should not exist. They absolutely should. However, if that's the only thing I'm seeing on the shelves, I can begin to create an idea that, uh, wow, being black means persevering and um, bad things have to happen to you. And that's really, I, I, um, it didn't really fuel my imagination and it didn't, I felt that I was not being seen or being written about. Uh, so given so, that, yeah. given that, read a little bit about from your book that gives us a sense of what you wrote because you wanted to see it. Well, um, I uh, my book is about a girl who is psychic. She's biracial and, um, and lives in Berkeley. And she's psychic, her psychic ability is connected to tattoos specifically. Um, now the section that I chose to read does not deal with her powers, but I wanted to show how a story that was not, I wanted to write about, I, I mean, race is an element in the story. It has to be because, you know, she is she's biracial. She presents black, but her mother is white. She doesn't know who her father is, and her mother had a boyfriend who she adored, and that man was black. And it's the first time in her life 
when he was in their lives that she felt like a cohesive family, that she felt like there was somebody who she was like, that she looked like. And so I wanna read um, a passage from that because even it's, it's an element of the story. Luther and my mother dated for about three years. Echo was two years old and I was 12. Luther was the longest relationship my mother ever had with a guy. My mother met Luther because Dusty had gotten into a fender bender in front of the studio. It was her fault apparently, and since the big guy whose Audi she had hit was kind and not going off on her, she suggested they exchange car information inside. He agreed and met my mother, who was finishing up on a client who had gotten a design of the Beetlejuice character. The work was done and the tattoo bandaged. My mother and the client were dancing with abandon around the studio. My mother had Harry Balfonte Calypso music blaring through all the speakers. And Luther really dug the vibe of the music and the shop, and he dug my mother. They started dating immediately. The time Luther was in our lives was magnificent. He showed a lot of interest in both Echo and me, taking Echo to the park and pushing her on the swings and going to teen girl movies with me. I'll never forget him picking me up after a robotics club tournament where my team had been soundly trounced in the competition. We had been soundly trounced because of me. I had screwed up something in the schematics and there was an entire function our robot was not able to complete. I was sobbing outside the auditorium when Luther pulled up in his car. He had been sent to get me because my mother was running late with other errands. Luther listened to my crying and all the guilt I was placing on my shoulders. He didn't try to say things like, it wasn't your fault, because it was. Or you'll do better next time, because of course I would. I would never make a mistake like that again. He didn't state the obvious. He held me close and let the tears fall until I didn't have any left. Then he took me out for ice cream and we watched a brilliant sunset from Indian Rock. We didn't say another word about the robotics competition. Instead, we, dis we discussed in detail the Lincoln assassination and the crazy manhunt involved with John Wilkes Booth. The sky was purple and orange as the sun drifted into the Pacific Ocean. And as we excitedly talked about the level of Booth's celebrity and how he escaped wearing drag, others jumped in with their opinions. It was such a Berkeley moment with university philosophy professors, artists, rocket scientists, carpenters and auto mechanics engaging in a lively discussion about Lincoln's death, the layers of conspiracy and the 12 day search for Booth. Luther held his own, he always does. I think it is my fondest memory of Luther Tucker. That's wow. lovely. Very nice. That's lovely, thank you. Um, let's go now to Tina. <laughs> Um, during the first year of the pandemic, I really embraced the whole notion of isolation. Um, I, I took to heart the admonition to stay at home. And I wrote my ninth book, It Happened on Our Watch. And the reason that I write is because I want to, and I write short, I write bite-sized books that really are intended to whet the appetite of the reader so that they, have, I hope, are encouraged to read more, perhaps from other authors about the same subject. So I am going to be reading not from It Happened on Our Watch, but from on closer inspection. And in, on closer inspection is about uh, Violet, a domestic day worker, and her husband, Everett, a Pullman porter. Both of those jobs were iconic in the Black community. They were the first paid jobs that black people could get when they were freed from slavery. 
And I will be looking down as well and holding my book out because I don't have on my glasses. So the day had passed without incident, just the typical endless smiling, watching, waiting, and wordlessly serving. It was when the women and children were tucked in for the night that some of the male passengers turned coarse, rude, and mean. Man, I hate the night more than any other time, said Paul, one of the more respected porters on board. It's the dark and the drink. It gives them license to be who they really are, replied Everett as the porters prepared for the nightly battle. And it only gets worse the later it gets. The tensions and comments were always the most hurtful on the second night of the run. By then, the most powerful passengers started throwing their weight around. They were indiscriminate as they bullied and demeaned both passengers and staff. From their tiny porter's car and over the clang of the wheels on the track, the on-duty porters could hear demands coming from the main car. Boy, we need more drinks out here. If they cared, the passengers could have surmised that the porters had just barely gotten the demanding passengers' wives and children settled for the night, but they didn't care. It didn't matter to them. They needed more drinks. Most people feared the midnight hours, known as the witching hours, but Pullman porters knew the real danger lurked in the hours just after dinner had been served up until the last drink had been consumed. For Pullman porters, there were hours that brought out the real demons. In a menacing tone, new money had demanded, George, sing something. I don't sing, sir. Well then dance, tell a joke, do something to entertain us. They cornered newly hired Porter, looked around at his fellow Porters and silently beseeched them to come to his aid. Everett knew from experience that the passenger's request for entertainment would come that the requests would turn to demands and the demands would turn ugly. As usual, before things could escalate, Everett stepped into the center aisle of the ornate passenger's car, just beneath the chandelier where he knew the light would catch the glow of his skin, the whites of his eyes and teeth and the fit of his uniform. As usual, he waited a few long seconds for effect, opened his mouth and sang in his deepest baritone. Oh, Danny boy, the pipes, the pipes are calling. As usual, the most unruly of passengers fell under Everett's well-crafted spell. As usual, he saw the bewilderment on their faces as they had all been expecting a Negro spiritual or a blues tune. As usual, whether they were Irish or not, for some reason, they all felt a kinship with Danny Boy. As usual, it calmed them. As the stunned applause died down and before they were able to demand more, Everett went about his duties. He picked up stemware, beer, mugs and highball glasses, whether empty or full. And as usual, there was no pushback or quibbling. It was as if the passengers saw Everett and by extension, the rest of the staff in a new light. From that point on, the passengers treated them a bit better for the remainder of the run, except those who didn't. So that was from On Closer Inspection, um, and that was is part of the Bridge to Freedom series, my second series. So with that, I'd like to call on Dira. Dira, <laughs> why do you write? I write 
because I'm curious, I'm inquisitive, I wanna know things. And I think that our stories need to be told. And uh, it was something reading led to writing and writing about my childhood came about um, as a sort of a surprise, but it started off by seeing different people later on in my uh, growing up in Oakland. And then as an adult seeing people out in the stores or at Kaiser Hospital or different places. And it started with, do you remember when? And I decided to write down stories of, do you remember when, of growing up? Because Oakland has changed so much from the time I grew up in the late 50s and 60s. But uh, also I write because as Toni Morrison said, if there's a book you want to read, then you write it. I'm not saying, uh, saying exactly how she says it, but in other words, uh, the reason I wrote about uh, my, my novel is about the great migration of Blacks coming to Oakland and um, the Blacks that got their got college education in the South and they came to Oakland for a better opportunity. And I want to tell their, want to tell their stories. So I, th that's what I call being a storyteller, being curious, curious and writing about it. On, on that note, would you read a little bit from your book? Yes, I will. I want to read uh, My Blackberry Summer, but it's, too, it's one of the longer stories and it's much too long to condense. So I'm gonna read Substitute Teacher. I was in first grade at Garfield Elementary School. One morning I sat down in my seat and to my surprise, the principal walked in with my mother. Class, today you have a substitute, Mrs. Jones. I sat there staring, eyes wide open. I was thinking that mama didn't tell me she was going to be my teacher today. My mother went to different schools to substitute in Oakland. She had taught school, school full-time in Arkansas after graduating from Philander Smith College in Little Rock. When she came to Oakland, she needed a California teaching credential to teach. So she went to the University of California at Berkeley while she worked in the cannery at night. After she received her, her credentials, she was hired as a substitute teacher in 1957. It would do, be two years before she was hired as a permanent teacher at Lockwood Elementary in East Oakland. After the principal left, my mother said, good morning class, I'm Mrs. Jones and I will be teaching you your lessons today. I piped up and said, hi mama. My mother looked over at me, looking over the roll book and said, it's Mrs. Jones. Everyone looked at me. Somebody said, is that your mother? My mother repeated, I am Mrs. Jones today. She looked at me and smiled, but I knew that she was my mother. That day she was my teacher and therefore she was Mrs. Jones, not only to other students in my class, but to me also. Somehow, somehow I got through the day without calling her mama. We laughed about it later that evening. Yeah, that's, that's such a sweet story. And I can't even imagine what it would be like to have my mother as a teacher for a day. I mean, and, and, and the other thing, I'm listening and your name is Dira Jones Williams. Yes, yes. And I'm Tina Jones Williams. So yes, yeah, we talked made, about that. <laughs> it made me giggle. Mm -hmm. That is yeah. such a sweet story. Um, Next, last, but certainly not least, uh, Jerry Forte. Why do you write? 
Oh, I love to talk. I love to tell stories. I was an educator for 43 years of my professional work. I was a teacher. I was a counselor. I've been a principal of a junior high school and a high school. I've been a central office administrator. I have taught students on the university level. And throughout those 43 years and those different aspects of education, I found myself counseling all of the time. I was counseling students. I counseled their parents. I counseled coworkers. I counseled teachers who were new to the profession and were daunted by what was going on. And so I developed a tool during that counseling that I call the circle of understanding to help you get through any type of a painful situation. In essence, if someone has hurt you or disappointed you, it's natural to feel anger, resentment. I would counsel individuals to try to understand the background of that individual. You know, what brought them to the place where they made those types of decisions and those types of actions. When you can understand that, you can forgive them for hurting you, be it a sibling, a mate, a parent, a friend, a coworker, the neighbor down the street, you can forgive them. And then when you have forgiven them, learn to forgive yourself for being angry with them. Because if you hold on to that anger and resentment, it eats at you like a cancer. When you can understand and you can forgive, you can love them in spite of who they are. I'm not advocating and I never did advocate that a person remain in a toxic relationship. Sometimes you do have to say, I forgive you, I love you and walk away, you know, for the betterment of everyone. So the stories that I would tell, I would tell um, students stories when they would come to me with problems with their parents or with a teacher or with a sibling. And those stories evolved into my writing. I tell stories and they're not false stories. Every story I tell has elements of truth in it. In the book, A Brand New Song to Sing, I think about the, um, oh, the caricature of African-American men as being, you know, dogs, mean, evil, womanizers. And I tell the story of Ralph Jenkins, who was none of those things. He was a wonderful man. I'm gonna read a portion from this book. Ralph has been with his um, living girlfriend, Viola Powell, for about 15 years. They did everything together. They went to church together, uh, planned bid whist parties together, went on cruises. He cooked, she cleaned, you name it. Anyway, he did become ill. He passed away. So we are now at the funeral. Everybody in the sanctuary gasped at the same time, almost in synchronized unison. Then when they realized that they were really seeing what they were not sure they were seeing, they all gasped again, much louder the second time. The music had abruptly stopped and then they all saw her dressed from head to toe in burnt orange brocade from her Nefertiti style headdress to her form fitting suit and her matching high heels and handbag as she stood in the pastoral pulpit, pointing her right index finger on a perfectly manicured hand at the dearly departed. On cue, the mortuary people came in single file down the center aisle and surrounded the casket. Upon the next signal from her finger, which was a demonstrative counterclockwise way to the entrance to the sanctuary, they deftly rolled the casket with its non-living occupant out of the church into the hearse. And then they drove away before anyone could find their voices to question, object, or say anything. Dumbfounded, everyone looked toward this woman and wondered who she was, and more importantly, what has she just done and why? She raised her right hand, 
resplendent with long burnt orange painted fingernails with diamond studs. And the room immediately silenced to hear what she had to say. To the members of this church, I'm so sorry to have disappointed you on this day. You came to say goodbye to one of your church members and to console the family he has left behind. Allow me to introduce myself. I am Mrs. Ralph Jenkins and I have been and I am still his legal wife. We have been married for more than 33 years, although we've been separated for the last 19. My late husband, God rest his soul, will be memorialized in a private ceremony at the church where our four children were baptized. His remains will be cremated and the ashes will be taken out to sea one month from today. I will take my leave now. God bless you all. She stepped down from the pulpit and regally walked down the center aisle with her gold jewelry sparkling in the light so that it appeared as if hellfire flames were shooting from her countenance. She walked down the center aisle without acknowledging anyone through the door and out of the church. It took a few moments for it all to register with everyone. When it did, the voices of astonishment rose. Viola lost it all physically and emotionally at that time. Oh, she stole his body. She stole his body. Now she, she's going to have him burnt up. Somebody stop her, please. Stop her. Okay, and the rest of the book talks about how they got to that point. There are vignettes from all of the people in Ralph and Viola and the wife, Clafonda Janine's life, including their parents. So you hear the story of how they fell in love in Atlanta. Uh, Clafonda Janine was of the upper um, crust Atlanta Black society, whereas Viola Powell was a sister girl from the Bay Area. Well, so Jerry, I, I think that the way that you read from your book will make us all want to read it. I've already read it, so I may have to read it again. <laughs> okay. Because I obviously missed some points. Um, we're gonna shift gears a little bit at this point and talk about our process as writers. Um, I'll start this part and then I will turn it over to Robin. Um, I began writing before I even knew that I was writing. I used to years ago when I saw a poem that I enjoyed or a scripture that particularly resonated with me on a day or just a quote, I would throw, write it down and throw it in a book, I mean, in a, in a, in a basket and one day I sat down and I began to write and I wrote my first book, Some Things I Want You to Know. And it was nothing more than things that I had, information that I had garnered over the years. And they were things that I knew for sure. And I wanted to pass those on to my children. So I put them together in a little book booklet and gave it to some people for Christmas, my kids, other people in the family. And they said, you need to publish this. So I did. And then I realized that I had more that I wanted to say. So each book that I've written has really led to the next one. The first four uh, in the Julia Street series really speaks to a time and place and people that I believe should never ever be forgotten. Then the Bridge to Freedom series also speaks to people, but they were composites of people that I had known, whereas the Julia Street series is based on actual people 
that I know, relatives, friends, people from the neighborhood. And then my latest book, it happened on our watch. I wrote during the first year of the pandemic and it was simply to try to understand how we got to where we are at this point as a people, as a country, as a world. And it was really um, kind of a testament to that quote that says, writers write to understand rather than to be understood. And it, I fully embrace that. So my process really, I start with a title and then I write my book to match that title. So that's kind of my process, gathering thoughts, gathering quotes, gathering scripture, gathering anecdotes, gathering conversations and turning them into books. So Robin, I would like for you to talk a little bit about your process. Um, well, I also have, I've been a writer for, a long time. I wrote tons of things when I was a kid. I wrote plays. I would make up stories. I wrote um, puppet shows. I was my <laughs> a younger sibling and I would write out puppet shows and um, we would perform them at his birthday parties. Um, and then as I got, uh, as I was older, I started doing, um, well, I wrote more stage plays uh, in college and then that went into screenwriting. Um, and then I was I was working in uh, film and television, and I worked with writers um, as a development executive. So, um, but and even like when I, I would write short stories on the side, but I never had actually done the thing that I really wanted to do, which was write a novel, because I was kind of scared of it. Um, but I eventually did, and I and it was took a lot of discipline. And that was the thing that was hard for me was the discipline to sit down and, and do it and, and get the whole story out. Um, my process is I actually start with a character and I start with the character and kind of think what, what would really upset that character? Like, where's that conflict? Where, what, what can I do to mess up their day? And then that's what I do. I come up with all these various things to mess up their day. And then I mess up their day some more. And then I do it some more. <laughs> so it's just till, till the finally where you where we've reached the point where nothing more can go wrong. And then more goes wrong. And then I get to fix it all somewhat. Now, do you do you write and edit at the same time? Or do you write the whole thing and then go back and edit? I have learned not to do them both at the same time. That actually was what I was doing previously was I was writing and then editing, going back and editing before I kept writing. Yeah. And that for me kept it so I never really got past page 60. Um, once, and this was where the discipline came in. Once I was able to just write out the story, even if I thought it was terrible, because yes. most of the time, I mean, our first drafts, they stink, yeah. you know? I mean, you know, I'm writing and I'm going, oh my God, this is awful. Oh, ah, ah, ah. But I'm getting it out. I'm getting it out because editing actually for me is fun. So, but I've written essentially what I call brain vomit. And now I get to go back and I get to craft the story and I get to work. I, um, relationships are very big with me. So even though my, my book, Ink for the Beloved is about, a girl who's psychic, but it's at the heart of it, it's a mother-daughter story. Right. It's about right, a girl right. having to deal with a really problematic mother, a mother who has made decisions that have essentially screwed up her day. Um, and in the second book, it's about, uh, I have my character, she's looking for her father. She's looking for her biological father. And what does that be? And she actually feels, I mean, I, re I read that passage about Luther, this man that she loves, and that's her father, her father figure. So she feels like she's actually um, betraying him by looking for her biological father. But this whole thing, she has a psychic ability and she's thinking maybe it's genetic. Maybe that's how I got this is because 
there's this man out there who can actually kind of train me and mentor me and show me how to handle what I can do. That's not what happens. Anyway, um, I'm going to I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop, stop you there because we need to hear now from Jerry and her process. Jerry? Jerry, you're muted. Okay, sorry, I, I'm unmuted now. I had to sneeze and I didn't want to do it in your ears. No problem. Okay. So what each is my, your writing process? Well, each of my stories has an element of truth in it. Um, I'll be talking with friends and they'll remark upon something that happened and I'll think, wow, I wonder how that came to be. Uh, for example, I had lunch show about a year and a half ago with my college roommate from over <clears throat> 50 years ago. <laughs> and she was telling me about the granddaughter of someone we knew in college and what had happened. And I thought, oh, wow, that'd be an interesting story. You know, what happened and what were all the decisions, activities that led up to that? So I take those things and I take uh, a lot of things from the counseling sessions I've had over these 43 years and I put them into writing. For example, my um, second book, actually the third one, The Sincerian Pound Cake Extraordinaire, A Recipe for Life, those were stories of young women who were in uh, the Youth Authority, California Youth Authority, now called the Juvenile Department of whatever it is. Uh, and they're all true stories. They all took place. The names, of course, have been changed and I kind of like uh, elaborated on some of the plot, but there are lessons to be learned. People make mistakes. They make mistakes that hurt you. You do things that hurt other people. Where do we go from here? So the overarching lesson is you understand, you forgive, and you love, and you can get through anything. And you know what you said, and then I'm going to move next to Kevin. My mother used to say this. Some people you have to love from afar. Yes, yes, yes. So with that, Kevin, what's your writing process? Well, my writing process is, is pretty simple. I mean, with, with a nonfiction book, you have to have relevancy in that, in whatever you're writing. So that's the way I approached my book. Uh, like I said, it was a, a series of essays that I was using for personal reflection. You know, I had no intentions on, on publishing it until I realized, hey, this is some good stuff in here that somebody else can use. I know that the, the topics that I cover in my, my book, everybody can relate to it because what I say is we either have done it ourselves or we know somebody who has gone through what I'm talking about. So um, my big selling point with my book is it'll help you or it will help you help somebody you know. So that's what I did with that. And I just have had to write it out. And I would, it would never get completed. And finally, I had uh, one of the best uh, advices that I had was from an author, a frat brother of mine, um, an actor actually, Joseph C. Phillips, who played uh, Martin on the Cosby Show. He he told me he said, "Your book is never going to be complete, but at some point you have to stop writing." Right. And, and and that's the, that's what I took. I was like, okay. He said, "You write it until you have told the story that you want to tell." and you publish it. He said, because if you don't, you will never publish it because you it will, will never, never be done. <laughs> that is so true. Um, this book that I just wrote, it happened on our watch. It is really a, I, I guess an autobiography. It, it talks about, it, it's me from the, before I was born until today. And I literally typed the last word and pushed publish because I did not want to have anybody else read it and talk me out of publishing it. <laughs> it was that it was that personal and that difficult to write. But so I understand what you're saying. At some point, you just have to say it's done, and you know, out to the world it goes. Because frankly, not everything is for everybody, so everybody won't like it. But that doesn't mean it's not worth reading. So exactly, that's and that's what he told me. You know, he said, "You." It, he. I asked him, "When do I? When would I know if it's done?" He said, "There's a difference between being done and complete." Exactly. <laughs> He's absolutely right. He's absolutely right. Um, so I'm going to ask uh, Dira. 
what is your process? Well, no, um, usually I have a list of ideas. Like I said, I'm curious and I wanna know things. And so then I'll do research and then I start writing. And after a while, um, just write out the whole thing and then come back and um, revise or rewrite. But on the note of, um, as you were saying that you just published, push the bu uh, publish button because you didn't want anybody to tell you something. So I, I wrote a, a novel about the civil rights, during civil rights. And that is still in my computer. Uh, it wasn't completely finished, but it, I have written quite a bit of it. And I had someone, I had someone and it, that kind of discouraged me, but um, I intend to publish that someday. But I, I think that you have to have an idea and then, uh, Usually you have to go back. I just write and write. And then in the middle of it, I have to go back and outline or either write out steps or write out a, a, a process. But uh, the first book, I, the first story I published was uh, in an anthology was about my um, grandmother's quilt. And, and it was called quilting the legacy. And my grandmother had Alzheimer's and she didn't finish the quilt. But my mother, uh, when she went back to Arkansas to bury her, she came, brought the quilt back and she finished the quilt. And that's what I wrote about. And that I, I got so many, I had so many people writing me from different places uh, when that was published about how that how much it touched them. So that's that that's what drives me is telling a story that people want to hear and uh, they can delight in. That's lovely. We are going to go into the lightning ride round now because we have like three minutes. And I want each one of you to tell me whatever you want to say as your parting words. And I will start with Robin. Um, parting words. Uh, read Ink for the Dam coming out in March. All right. <laughs> All right. Dira, parting words. Um, right. Um, read read and I've, I've been upset about this censor censorship and all the books that have been ban banned but our stories need to get out they need to be told and tell your stories i'm i'm proud of to be a part of the black gold storytellers uh with dr adrian oliver and we will be telling great migration stories thank you Kevin, parting words. Parting words. Uh, you're not too old. It's never too late. You're not stuck in your ways. If you have a goal, make a plan and go after it, period. Thank you. Jerry, <laughs> parting words. I believe your writing is fueled by your passion. So if there's something you're passionate about, write about it. Tell your story. Don't let anyone turn you away from telling your story. Thank you. Tina, parting words. <laughs> I have a friend, her name is Queen Anne Cannon. Years ago, before I ever thought of writing a word, she said to me, and I can't remember the context, everybody has at least 10 books in them. Queen Anne, I've written nine, so that means I have one more to go. But I will say this, everybody should and can write a book. And with that, I pass it on to all. 
Thank you so much for that great conversation. Uh, we have some time for questions. So um, if you have any questions or comments, uh, type them in the chat. And um, yeah, so our panelists can read them. Um, does anyone have any questions for our panelists? Just some wonderful comments. Uh, so inspiring. Thank you all, says Barb. Um, it's been wonderful. Wonderful presentation. Oh, we got a question here for Anu Puri. Was it difficult to get published? Anybody want to answer that question? Not for me. I uh, I was I, I actually was independently published, so, and a lot of people referred to that as self-publishing. So I didn't go through the traditional route of getting a publishing an agent or anything like that. I uh, had my my book edited. I uploaded it to Amazon and push publish. Ditto. Ditto. So I had several uh, stories published in anthologies and journals. So you have to submit to someone. Um, so if you have if you have the theme and you have the, the words, um, you submit and somebody says go and they accept it. But I got rejected a lot. I, I applied to a lot of, I submitted to a lot of places and I got rejected, but it's a part of the process. Rejection is part of the process. And any advice on getting published? All depends on what route you want to take. I mean, if, if you want to take the traditional route, it, it, it's a longer process rather than the self-publishing uh, route. But uh, you have everything falls on your shoulders when you are a self-published author. You have to deal with the marketing. You have to deal with getting the, the message out to a potential market, uh, the audience. All of those things falls directly on your shoulders. And I guess the flip side of that is you have all of the control. That was the second, that was the second part of my comment. <laughs> yes. And, you know, uh, more and more, the traditional route of publishing, uh, a lot of the marketing and that kind of thing falls on your shoulders there as well, because that market is not what it used to be either. So self-publishing is the way that I chose to go because it gives, gave me the opportunity to write what I wanted to write, how I wanted to write it, when I wanted to write it. Total control. Yeah, I, I just wanna add that that's, um, I mean, I've, I've done both routes, both traditional and uh, self-publishing, but for my um, series, I did wanna do uh, self-publishing primarily because I was, I was writing stories that I've not seen and there are reasons why we haven't seen them. And I actually had uh, someone give me notes at one point saying they questioned this black girl's experience. They were questioning it as if, what? I'm like, no, this is, you know, because she didn't live in a hood, because there wasn't a family member that wasn't dealing drugs, dealing with gangs, they were questioning her experience. But then that's precisely why I knew my book had to get out there. Well, you tell them, and we can swim too. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> professional swimmer right here. That was my sport. <laughs> so someone asked in the chat, how do we follow your work? How, what do we do to, to find you? Ladies first. The easiest is Amazon. Although, um, I mean, all of my books are, are available there, especially the books that are eBooks. But um, you can order our books usually through um, an independent bookstore. You just have to request it. A lot of people go to Marcus Books in Oakland and request that they order our books for them. Yeah. Or if you're comfortable, go to Amazon. And then some of my books are in the public library as well. So 
And mine, mine are on Amazon. They're on uh, Barnes and Noble. They're uh, on uh, di uh, Draft the Digital. Uh, they're available on my website as well. Uh, uh, on you can get contact me through Facebook. I'm on Facebook as well. There's a bunch of ways to get in touch with an author to find out how you can get their book, get samples of their work, and 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 what have you. Yeah, in my backyard is on Amazon, and um, you can find me on Facebook, Instagram, and uh, Twitter. All of my books are on Amazon and Barnes and Noble, and the book entitled "Of Prayers and Beatings" is also in um, audiobook format, and it's available from Audible.com. Here's a question for uh, Dira. What is your process for getting your work in an anthology? So the, there's usually something called a call for submissions. Um, they could be anywhere. That lot, most things are online now. So you get on the on list. You have to get on lists where writers uh, subscribe to, and. Um, you follow the guidelines and you write the best product, the best, uh, send your best writing in. And uh, there's there's just all kinds of ways. Um, there's publishing on online. Um, there's all different ways, but th th there's usually a call for submission. And where are those, where would they find those calls? Oh, the, um, on writer groups, um, there are all kinds of writer groups. You can find them on Facebook. You can put in black writers. You can just, you can put in writers and they'll, there's all kinds of groups. And people are always posting. They're always posting calls for submissions. You can even go to specific genres. So if you write mysteries, I mean, literally you could find black mystery writers or just mystery writers or female mystery writers or male mystery writers. Science fiction, I mean, you can go that specific with genres. Most anthologies try to have a theme of some sort so that all the submissions are um, similar or similar types of stories. I just had someone a asked... someone just, I saw it, I, I okay. saw that question. Um, it's interesting that they asked that question because my, my education is in marketing. That's what I did. Uh, that's how I, I got my education. So um, as far as uh, marketing the book, it, it just a matter of getting it out to as many people as I could because my book uh, as, uh, with it being self-development, it's a tough genre because there's nothing ever wrong with anybody. You know, but the self-development industry is nine billion dollars a year. So there's something wrong with somebody. So so it's a matter of getting the information out to as many people as you can. And I use social media. I use a um, I'm working with a, uh, a marketing strategist now to get it, the uh, the reach expanded to the book, because I think a lot of people would benefit from it. But I have to get over the stigma of it's a self-development book. There's something wrong with me. Well, there's you don't have to have anything wrong with you in order to improve. And that's the message I'm trying to get through my book. It, 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 a lot of people see it and they say, well, there's nothing wrong with me. I don't need his book. Well, what I'm trying to do with my book is say, hey, I've been through some things and here's what I did to help me. Maybe it can help you. And, and, and it kind of it kind of breaks down that wall of uh, there's nothing wrong with me. I don't need your book. <laughs> right, right. So there's any a, any other questions, Paul? Yeah, there's a. There's a question here from Kevin, Kevin T. Uh, actually, no, I'm sorry. Uh, there's a good question here from uh, Kita. Kita, how have your elders inspired you? Oh my goodness. <laughs> I, I learned so many things from people that I've learned throughout the years from family members to supervisors in the Air Force to uh, mentors, all of those things that I, I just had to it, actually writing my book was therapeutic for me because I had to relive some of those lessons that I had up to that point chosen to ignore. 
And it just brought all of those things back to the forefront. And it was like, okay, they, they, they weren't crazy. They were, they, they said something that was intelligent. So it, it actually helped me out quite a bit. Can I say something? I, uh, sitting on my grandmother's in Arkansas porch, listening to the stories of the elders, that, that is uh, so inspiring. And the, the wisdom and the, the being the grills, the hearing their stories, um, it's all it's all good. It's all it's all father for for writing. And I would and have I'm, to agree I'm, with that because um, I I have five siblings. The first four are uh, one right after the other, and then eight years later, me. And then eight years later, my little brother. So when the first four were teenagers, I was like five-ish. And so I would just sit on the outskirts of the living room and listen to them when they got together and their friends were there. And I heard all their stories. <clears throat> and then my mother and father and their friends came over and I heard all their stories. And I co-opted them and made them part of my story. So it's all part of that same chain of information that hopefully gets passed from them to me, to my children, to their children, the elders. I mean, that's where, that's, that's where it all started in my writing. Absolutely. My, my storytelling started with my grandparents. The year that I was eight, we actually lived with them for a year, and they lived in a rural area in Halifax, Virginia. They didn't have a television, but they had a radio. So every night after supper, grandma would, you know, school us on Bible stories. Then grandpa would start telling us his stories, things that had happened. And of course, he embellished them quite a bit, but he taught us lessons. The story of the little boy who broke his mother's rules and went too far into the blackberry bush to pick blackberries, fell down a hill and was bitten by rattlesnakes. Scared us half to death, but there was a lesson in there. Number one, when your mama say, don't go do that, don't go over there, don't do it. <laughs> you know? So all of his stories, you know, and we used to sit back just all ooh and on. They weren't all gruesome stories. Some were fun stories. They had wonderful endings. But I learned the art of storytelling from my grandparents. They were champions. Absolutely. I know if you if you read my book, I can tell you that my my influence and the the things that I learned from different people throughout my life are written throughout my book. You, you'll see me reference the stuff that I learned from my dad, from my mom, uh, from influencers, wherever, you know, I, I'm, I'm a big proponent of you can learn something from anybody that you meet, you learn what to do, or you can learn what not to do. So you can, you can take bits and pieces and you can use what you need to apply to your life to make it better. Absolutely. Absolutely. Anything else, Paul? Uh, yeah, there's a question here from uh, Janine. Uh, did you write with a writing group or is there, um, do you write uh, with a group or is there a support group that the writing group that you, uh, you're a part of? I am very much a solitary writer. I go in my office and I write in my office. So I, I've been writing groups. Uh, right now I'm writing with, um, a accountability partner read each other and uh, critique each other's work but writing groups are writing groups are if you can find a good writing group um, it's like gold yeah I would def it's very hard to find one um, so when you do find one just yeah latch on to them um, I work solitary most of the time, but I do have an accountability writing group um, that I treasure. And, uh, you know, a lot of times people will, they'll catch things that, you know, in your story that you, you know, it's all in your head, you think it makes sense, but they might catch some of the little things. Um, and we just really support each other. I also use ARC readers. 
So those are advanced readers. So after my book is done, I do send it out to select people who read the whole thing. And then if there's any stuff that needs tweaking or if they didn't understand a passage, those are the people who let me know. Yeah. yeah. I have a content I, uh, editor, um, which means that beyond just the, you know, making sure that the commas and all of that are in the right place, she actually helps me elevate my writing. So um, she's worked with me, but on my last book, nobody read it from an editing standpoint because I just pushed publish and let it go. Well, for me, my, my readers actually provided me feedback. Uh, I published my book uh, uh, the first time in 2018. And from the feedback I got from people, I actually had to go back and, re, uh, and republish a second edition of my book because a lot of things weren't quite, quite clear. I knew how I wanted it to be delivered, but it didn't get that, it didn't come that way across to the reader. So I had to go back and revamp a couple of things and add a few things here and there. And I actually republished it again in 2020. I do most of my writing between two and five in the morning because it's quiet, there are no cars, there's no phone ringing. So for that reason alone, I'm not really in a writing group. What I am part of is a five member critique group. And we're all in, in, in different genres, um, mystery, um, science fiction, fiction, um, nonfiction and poetry. And we meet once a week, we look at a chapter of our writing and we give our impressions of it. And I find it to be just invaluable. You know, like, like one comment I had a few weeks ago, this is good, but when you're reading it, I can understand more of what you're trying to say. That passion, the voice is not coming through in your writing. You're writing, all the characters sound alike. They sound like you. And I thought, well, I did write it, but that was true. It was my voice in every character. So I'm learning how to adjust and having that critique group to look at my writing. And we're very um, open with each other. We don't insult each other, but we say what we feel. And, you know, I think it's wonderful. The first three books that I wrote, I didn't have any editor. I did it all. And um, I'm working on another book right now. And my critique group has been invaluable to me. Oh, okay. Uh, and I just want to add that the, the Livermore Public Library, uh, uh, let me uh, get myself back on screen here. Anyway, uh, uh, the Livermore Public Library has a uh, writers meetup that meets uh, on Zoom every, uh, every first Tuesday of every month. And it's an informal group of uh, writing enthusiasts and they, 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 they meet and talk about writing and also uh, they do some writing exercises. So uh, if, if you wanna learn, learn more about that, uh, visit our website or uh, talk, to, uh, talk to me or one of our librarians. Um, anyway, uh, let me show myself here. Okay, here I am. Uh, on behalf of the Livermore Public Library, I'd like to thank our, our panelists today, uh, Tina, Robin, Dira, Kevin, and Jerry for joining us this evening. And uh, this has been a wonderful conversation. Uh, a lot of people attended, which I'm very pleased and uh, we're all very pleased. And I, all the attendees uh, seek out these authors, follow them. Uh, read their read their books, um, and uh, that concludes our program. I'd like to thank you all again, and uh, yeah, uh, stay tuned. You'll see this recording this this program on our, the library's uh, YouTube channel. Um, with that, again, thank you again, Tina, for bringing us all together tonight. Such a wonderful program. And thank you to all our panelists and attendees. Thank Have you. a thank wonderful you. Thank evening. Thank you, Paul, for the opportunity. Thank you. We appreciate <laughs> it. Thank you. Good night. Okay. Good night. Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night. Stay safe. You too.